have slowly worked my way into just becoming a full-time videographer. When I'm not doing that, I buy antlers. Uh, we just started posting and we said, hey, we're trying to help a family out. If anybody has some antlers laying around, let us know. We'll come pick them up. And we we're actually able to raise uh, just shy of $1,000 worth of antlers. It was a single mom with five kids and the dad had just up and left and moved out of the out of the state. And, and she kept saying, no, you know, give it to somebody else. But we ended up spending quite a bit of money on her family just because I knew there was something missing. I just remember riding my horse back to camp with, with the northern lights and the moose behind me. And I'm like, this is this is why I've done this. This is as cool as an experience as I will get. It's uh, hopefully this year, it's just gonna be bigger and better. We've got a pretty big goal of helping 100 families, which is gonna take a lot of antlers and a lot of money. The biggest thing that we need help with right now is if anybody knows of a family in need, um, then go to our website and it's just shedsforsanta.com. What's up guys, this is Sawyer Peacock. You are listening to the Living Country in the City podcast number 46. Y'all ready for your dose of flyover state spirit? Straight from the concrete jungle? Well, put down your latte and pull on your boots. It's time for Living Country in the City. Hey, y'all. Thanks for joining me for episode 46 of Living Country in the City. Uh, Today, I'm talking with my good buddy Sawyer Peacock about the nonprofit he started, Sheds for Santa. It's a really great program, so let's hop on it. Sawyer, thanks for joining me on the call today. Hey, thanks for having me, man. So before we get started, why don't you uh, just give me a little bit of background, maybe about yourself and how you got your start in the hunting and outdoors. Yeah, um, so I grew up here in Utah, which happens to be, or what seems to be like the hunting business capital of the world for some reason. <laughs> um, I mean, you've got all your major companies and stuff, and and I grew up hunting as well. So uh, it was probably five years ago, um, I was talking to one of my buddies and and he said that they had a moose tag and he, he'd always been filming. Um, always had a little interest or interest in photography and filming and stuff like that. And so I said, well, let me come along. And, and we kind of learned a little bit and we killed the moose. And ever since then, I, uh, I just picked up a camera, got a cheap one online to start off with. And I started filming and taking pictures. Um, and I got into like weddings and stuff like that, um, to help kind of pay the bills, but then, uh, have slowly worked my way into just becoming a full-time videographer um and photographer so i do that for about six or seven months out of the year and when i'm not doing that i buy antlers so it's a little bit different um not a lot of people have heard about it. i mean in utah it's fairly common but other places it's something else so i travel to all the small cities here in utah and i uh, take my truck and trailer and i just buy antlers um and then i use those to um, turn into dog shoes. Uh, we send some to China overseas, just things like that. So it's kind of how I got my start into the hunting world, I guess, is kind of just by buying antlers. Um, then we've worked my way into, uh, now I film for a couple YouTube channels and things like that. So now you grew up around hunting, but it sounds like you didn't necessarily grow up hunting then. No, no, I did. Um, not, not as heavily as some of the people you see now. I mean, we were, we were the typical road hunters growing up, you know, I mean, (laughs) I I shot my first deer when I was 12 and I've shot a deer, you know, pretty much every year since. And so I grew up in the thick of it, but we weren't the hardcore, you know, backpacking in camp. And we were, if we could go up on the four wheeler and a lot of that contributed, my, my dad's disabled. So we weren't able to go out, but we had good times. We hunted. I grew up fishing and camping every single weekend. Um, so I did grow up in it, but not not as thick as some other people, I guess. <laughs> but it's just been contagious in my life, you know. So it's uh, been fun. I gotcha. And, yeah, so I've, I've talked a, a little bit with uh, Ben Denamati. Uh, yeah. Sh- shed Crazy. Yeah. A little bit about shed hunting and, you know, what uh, I'm sure you've had – more than your fair share of experiences with him. Oh yeah. Um, Oh yeah. (laughs) But yeah, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, shed hunting and all of that stuff and just what the sheds are used for and all that. And I think we made some crass jokes about what they use them for after they're shipped over to China. Um, (laughs) Yep. 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 Get all that for these yaks. Oh man. All those elk antlers. Yep. (laughs) Um, So now with that, uh, you know, getting right into it, you buy, you buy sheds, you know, sheds are kind of your business. Um, but you've started, uh, you know, I don't know, 
I guess I don't know really what to call it a charity or 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 whatever it is, but you do what's called sheds for Santa. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's uh, the way that came apart um, around was it's been four years now. Um, my neighbors and and I had just gotten married when we first started. My neighbor had been in a trucking accident and had broke his back. Um, super nice guy. And with the way just everything worked out in insurance and stuff, it was just going to cost him a fortune. He was out of work, laid up, couldn't do anything. Um, so I remember calling my best friend, Ken. I said, man, we, we've got to help these guys. But, you know, around Christmas time, if, if everybody else is like me, which I'd imagine a whole handful of ours, we don't really have a ton of extra money to be given away around Christmas, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I thought it's, it's too hard to go ask people for money and, and to help, but what could I do? Um, and I just thought, you know, most of my friends have antlers laying around and this was before I had gotten into the antler buying business. Actually. Um, I thought most of them have antlers laying around. I know that there's a buyer that would buy it. So, uh, we just started posting and we said, Hey, we're trying to help a family out. If anybody has some antlers laying around, let us know. We'll come pick them up and, once we sell them, we use the money to buy the family Christmas. So we did that. We pushed it for four or five days, and we were actually able to raise uh, just shy of a thousand dollars worth of antlers. Nice. Um, so we found a local antler buyer, sold them, and we were able to buy that family Christmas. And I guess I didn't think too much of it uh, four years ago. I just thought, well, that was kind of a fun year thing. And then the, the following year, somebody said, "Hey, are you going to do that again?" And I thought, well, you know, we could see. Maybe we could help two or three families this time. So. We did the same thing, post a little bit more, and, and got some companies to share the posts and stuff like that. And sure enough, we ended up raising, uh, I believe it was $3,500. Um, and that was enough to buy for about 10 families. So we found 10 families in need, bought them all Christmas. And I was like, man, that's kind of cool. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to push it hard for the next year. So that would have been last year. And uh, with some help of some pretty cool people uh, pushing it and helping and donating, we were able to raise uh, – almost thirty thirty two thousand dollars wow um so it just tenfold in you know the last <laughs> couple of years it just blew up last year i just i couldn't believe it um and so just with that money we were able to help 48 families um so now i've i've gone through we've turned it into a fully non-profit business um it's a full-on charity so it's uh hopefully this year it's just going to be bigger and better we've got a pretty big goal of helping a hundred families, which is going to take a lot of antlers and a lot of money. <laughs> That's exciting though, man. Like it's, you know, a thousand dollars just kind of on the spur of the moment is, is incredible. But then just looking at that growth is, is super exciting. I think it also says something too about the, the, the group of people involved, uh, you know, yourself included, um, but just the group of people involved in in helping to raise that money and and their spirit and their excitement to help others out. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's a it's a good group to be around too. I mean, and and most of the money came from the hunting community. Um, a lot of the money came from auctioning off antlers on sites. So somebody with a four point deer antler would post up and say, "Hey, we're going to auction this off." And sometimes they were going for three or four hundred bucks, which was amazing to me. Um, so it's pretty cool to see how generous people become. Um, around this time of year and, and are willing to help everybody out. That's fantastic. And so you're saying uh, also you've got some, over the past couple of years, you've had some companies involved as well? Yeah. Um, we, we've done some auctions where people, uh, companies will auction off stoves. I mean, Camp Chef has done some uh, like a smoker and things like that. We've got some companies this year that are going to be auctioning off uh, sleeping bags that they make and things like that. So it's now turned into more and just antlers. Uh, she with some people, uh, antler trader Josh Corbin, him and his wife auctioned off a shed hunt with them, and it went for like $1,500, and they took somebody out and found, you know, 20 elk sheds, and then those were ended up being donated back to me as well for Sheds for Santa. So it's pretty cool uh, what, what people are willing to do. So that's one of the biggest things is a lot of people say, well, I don't have antlers to give or anything, but it doesn't it doesn't have to be just antlers. I mean, that, that's how we started, but now people are auctioning off everything they're doing services guided hunts we've auctioned off a coos deer hunt in mexico just cool things like that that's really exciting and you know that it's just it's growing past you know just people donating sheds but it it's kind of drawing together that whole community um so what uh i mean i don't really know how to phrase this but what kind of what kind of families do you help out with sheds for santa or i guess 
you know, you say families in need, what would you say are the, I guess, the requirements or what do you look for uh, when you're kind of choosing families to help out uh, this holiday season? For sure. Yeah, that's that's probably the hardest part of our whole process is finding the deserving families. Um, and so as what we've, what we've kind of done is we almost do a, a screening process or an application. So you apply a family on our website and uh, I'll go through it and it'll just give us some brief details, you know, whether they're single parent or how many kids they have, kind of what their situation is. And a lot of, we, we've had a mixed bag of, of reasons why, but there's anything from um, families where the dad has been hospitalized, um, is out of work, things like that. So, I mean, most of our families are, are very hardworking, deserving families that have just had a crappy situation put on them. Um, we do a lot of single parent families. Last year, uh, probably my favorite, my favorite family um, was brought to attention to us by by some friends, and they said that they'd heard of this family that just moved into an apartment by them, and it was a single mom with five kids, and the dad had just up and left, had moved out of the out of the state, and kind of no forewarning there, and so she was all on her own, and uh, the the neighbors had helped her get into this apartment, and we had, we'd got in touch with her and asked what they would need for Christmas, and she says, you know, we don't we don't need anything, we've got it taken care of. We've the neighbors brought us over a Christmas tree. Um, we've got stockings. That's, that's all we need. And uh, it was pretty cool to see how how humble she was. And and she kept saying, no, you know, give it to somebody else. But we ended up spending um, quite a bit of money on her family just because I, I felt like there was something, you know, I, I knew there was something missing. Um, and when those gifts got delivered and they told us that they had a Christmas tree, we walked into the front room. And it was a completely empty front room with a broken couch. The legs were leaning on one side. Um, and their Christmas tree was about a foot and a half tall fake tree. Um, didn't have lights on it or anything. And their stockings were cut out of a piece of lined paper. And they were stapled up onto the wall above that with their names written on them with a pencil. Um, and I just remember thinking like, holy cow, when I talked to this lady, it seemed like she had the world. Like she was talking like they had everything they'd ever need. And I walked in and there was a broken couch and a foot and a half tree with lined paper stockings. So, I mean, th those are a lot of the families that we're doing. Um, just good, humble people that have come across some hard times. That's, that's not really fair, you know? And a lot of the times I, you have to catch yourself. You look at the things and you go, man, well, the parents could do this to get out of a different situation, but it's not about the parents at this time of year. I mean, there's, there's not a single kid out there, no matter what their parents doing that deserves to go out with or without Christmas. Um, so we encourage anybody with it, you know, that knows somebody in a hard time, or even if they are to go ahead and apply them, uh, apply the family, because I mean, we're, we're going to do our best to help everybody. And it is, it is about the kids. Um, and like I said, none of them should go without Christmas. So no matter the situation, if, if a kid's going to go without a Christmas, we're going to help them out. So now it, it almost kind of seems like uh, just this type of thing and the type of people you look for. Do you get a lot of a lot of people almost applying for other families being like, hey, my neighbor or hey, my, you know, this relative of mine or or things of that nature? Yeah, I mean that's pretty much all that we get is is people applying somebody. Hey, I've got somebody that lives by me. Uh, I know that they're going through this, or I know they're going through that. Um, we we go to a lot of uh, low income schools, and we'll ask the principals and teachers because the teachers really know what's going on in those kids' life. You know, I mean they they see it every day, whether they're not bringing school or or whether they're not bringing lunch or their clothes or anything like that. So they really have a good idea of what's going on. So we go to a lot of different schools, um, get families from there. I'll bet we took 20 families from schools last year. Um, we go to a lot of church services and ask if there's anybody at their church that could use some help. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's pretty, pretty humbling to see what, uh, just your common neighbor can be going through and you may not know it, you know? So, I mean, most of the families, we do a good job of screening them, and, and they're all well, humble, deserving families that are just on a, on a bad a, or a streak of bad luck, which we all go through. So, uh, now how, uh, how far spread is the, is the nonprofit now? Is it, I'm assuming it's, uh, you guys are just, are staying local to Utah. Um, 
is it is it kind of in one, in one general area or are you all over the state uh you it's it's pretty much spread all over now i mean we help families from the very northern tip of utah all the way to st george in the south end and and we did a couple um families elsewhere too we had some I sent some gift cards to families in Idaho, California. Um, we've had a couple vets in Pennsylvania uh, that were, were going through some bad times, and we sent them some money. So hopefully by, by the end of this year, we'll pretty much be covering um, all the states. We're, we're going to be setting up some chapters and stuff in different states here in the next year or two um, to hopefully just get this bigger um, and help more people. So uh, we, we've covered most of Utah, and now we're just kind of reaching out and trying to hit other people. That's exciting. You know, it's that kind of growth is is just it's it's hard. You know, I'm sitting here. We had to turn the video off, but I'm sitting here grinning because that's just that's so great to hear. Um, so uh, now if people obviously, you know, people can can donate sheds. That's kind of where everything started. Uh, we talked a little bit about um you know, people uh, auctioning off shed hunts and and different hunts and, and, and gear and items. Um, are there any other ways, uh, that you're looking for, for help or ways that people can get involved, uh, other than, you know, necessarily financially or anything like that? No, for sure. Um, I mean, the biggest thing that we need help with right now is finding those families in need. Um, it's a lot of work to find a hundred families and get all of the information, um, as far as shoe size and what they need and clothes size and, and toys and names and things like that and addresses. So the biggest thing that we need help with right now is if anybody knows of a family in need, um, then go to our website and it's just shedsforsanta.com and there's um, an application tab where you can just apply a family. Um, and, and so that would probably be our biggest help because as we're getting bigger, it's hard for just me and my wife to go and find this many families and get all that information. Um, so doing that and then just spreading the word um, uh, one of the best ways to raise money is to do an auction. If somebody has has an antler that, um, even if it doesn't even mean anything, but if it means something to them or it's a, a big antler or a unique one or whatever, uh, Eric Chesser started it last year by auctioning them off, and they just post it up and, and put them for sale, and it's amazing what the community will do and how much they're willing to auction, even if it only goes for $20. I mean, that's still that's still a kid's pair of shoes, so... That's finding families right now is our, our biggest hurdle and and the thing that we need most help. No, that's great. I'm looking at the website right now. Looks like you got the application link. You got a donation link. Um, so if uh, if someone just has a stack of sheds that they want to just straight up donate, uh, it's the best way to just uh, hit you up through that website. Yeah, hit me up through the website or Instagram or, or anything like that. Um, the website's got a tab where you can message me directly. Um, and then if you're not within an area that I can reach you and get those antlers, I've got people spread out throughout all the states that um, can get a hold of you. And, and whether it's one antler or a truck bed full, um, we appreciate them all. I mean, they add up they add up really fast. So, um, yeah, if you've got any of those, the best thing to do is just to, just to send us a message through the website and we'll uh, find a way to get them from you. So, um, what is obviously, you know, you're probably willing to take donations, I'm sure you're around, but, uh, if somebody wanted to make sure they get, uh, get their donation, their sheds, you know, their auction or whatever in, in enough time to, to really help out for this year, what's, uh, what's kind of your, your end date that you try and get everything sent out by? Um, we're going to hope to have everything. Uh, picked up by the 14th of December. We will be buying on the 16th and doing all of our wrapping um, and things like that. But even if you do come at a later time, um, if we're not able to make it work, after we'll be just fine. Um, we will still have families trickling through um, clear up to Christmas and even some after Christmas that are just still needing some help. So we're going to push to have everything wrapped up by the 14th of December um, so we can go out and buy for all these families on the 16th. That's awesome. All right, y'all get to it got uh another two to three weeks to to find some gear to auction off or some sheds to to send out or or a hunt to plan whatever that might be so <laughs> yeah it's uh it's going to be coming up quick and and it's kind of tricky the way that this works because 
you know, we really only do about a three week period of where all these things start working together and raising money. Um, so, so we push it pretty hard for three weeks and it's pretty amazing the, uh, the amount of support that comes in during that time. Yeah. You know, I mean, like I said before, it's, I, uh, the one thing I've learned over the past, you know, two years that I've kind of really been getting into all of this is for the most part, the guys in this industry, the men and women, I should say, are just some of the most generous people with their time. And, and I've, I've yet to see a group of people that are more willing to try and help out complete strangers than, uh, than folks in the hunting industry so that I've seen so far. So exactly, exactly. And it's, it's cool. It's been cool to me to see. Um, I mean, obviously we have rival companies and, and stuff like that in the hunting world. Um, and people that may not get along and have different views, but it's cool to see all of them come together, um, to help with this cause. Like, um, you know, you've got different companies that may not see eye to eye, but they're all willing to come together to help with this. So that's been really cool. Um, for me to see it. And, and it's been cool to see how many people are willing to give up their time um, to come help. I mean, it's it, there's a lot of work that goes into this. So it's always good to have uh, people that I know are just as busy show up to help. Well, yeah, I was going to say, you know, it, <laughs> especially trying to help out 100 families, I, I imagine it's uh, not just you and your wife doing all the wrapping and all of the delivering. No, no, absolutely no. Yeah, that was, and, and the first two years it was, I mean, we maybe had a group of five or six people that was just close family. And, and last year when things started getting that big, I, I got nervous. I thought, man, if we're going to do 50 families, I can't even deliver to that many, you know, let alone <laughs> wrap all those presents. So with just a couple of posts, I'll bet we had over, over a hundred people show up that day, uh, willing to help to shop and buy and wrap and deliver. And so it was pretty cool. You know, and I, yeah, you know, I can imagine you'll be posting up about that uh, when when the time comes. But yep, uh, yep. if y'all are local and have some mad rapping skills, make sure you uh, you hit up Sawyer on Instagram or the website there also. Yeah, we can use uh, all the help we can get. There's always lunch provided, and and this year we'll actually be meeting here to Utah Cabela's. They've uh, been gracious enough to donate their uh, their space for us to wrap and everything in there. So. It'll be a good time. There'll be a lot of fun people there, and we'll uh, hopefully get a hundred families taken care of. Well, that'll be amazing, and you know, absolute best wishes and for me for uh, for that. Appreciate it. So once again, the website is sheds4santa dot com, and uh, it uh, it's just the website, right? Do you have any other social social media or anything for that? Uh, we do, we do have, yeah, we have, we have an Instagram that's just sheds for Santa as well. Um, and then you'll be seeing it throughout everybody else's all I've, uh, there'll be some companies posting about it as well. So the, basically our, our main hub right now is that website. Uh, that's the best way to donate, to get a hold of us or, or apply families. So. Perfect. Well, I will make sure to post those links up, uh, on the show notes page, which will be living country in the city.com slash 46 for episode 46. Um, and we'll, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully send a little bit of traffic your way. <laughs> no, I appreciate it, man. Any traffic's good traffic, right? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, so otherwise, how's your hunting season been this year? It's, uh, it's, it's been my best one yet, man. It's, uh, I had a couple, couple cool hunts that, that came through in my favor that, uh, I didn't think I was going to be able to go on for a long time. And I know that's not a good attitude to have, but they just seemed so far out of reach. And when it all came together, I was, uh, pretty amazed and pretty lucky with this year. So any, uh, uh, any, you're saying you had some special ones come through. What, uh, which ones are sticking out for you? Uh, I, I got to go on my sh first sheep hunt this year, um, which was, which was cool. I traveled to British Columbia, uh, with Jason Price and, and was able to film him, uh, take a, a great stone sheep, which, uh, was my first big international hunts. I've done some, some goats and other things, but this was my first back country off the grid out of country hunt. Um, and then following that, I, uh, I got lucky um, on a cancellation tag and got a phone call at midnight one night and I flew out <laughs> to Canada the next morning. Um, and I was able to, uh, 
actually hunt for myself, which is something that I don't get to do a ton when I'm filming. Um, so I was able to, to shoot a, a Canadian moose, which has been a dream of mine ever since I can remember. So just the way that that all played out and, and the hunt and the people I got to spend it with. And it was uh, pretty, pretty amazing. It's uh, something that I'll remember the rest of my life. So that's, that was pretty much the highlight of my year. Is that this picture I'm looking at with the with the the moose skull and like the aurora borealis in the background? Yeah, yeah, Jeez, that was man. that was it. That was my bull. Um, I had shot that bull on I don't know day three, I believe, and and as we were riding out that night, we're packing it out. The uh, the northern lights kicked in, and it, that's when it all became pretty surreal. You know, I mean, oh, I've been man. to a lot of cool places. I've done a lot of cool things, but. I just remember thinking, I'm like, holy cow, I'm, here I am, a 24-year-old kid, you know, just been working my guts out to get into this industry, working my guts out to to provide for my family. And when that, I just remember riding my horse back to camp with, with the northern lights and the moose behind me. And I'm like, this is, this is why I've done this. This is as cool as an experience as I will get. Um, so I, I had to stop and take a, take that picture because I was like, this is just too amazing. I'm just, I mean, I'm looking at this picture right now. I'll put up a link to it as well. It is, it's just ridiculous. It almost looks like I, I keep having to look at it because it, it looks fake almost. It's just too. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I mean, I just remember I turned back and, and one of my business partners, Steve said, man, you better look at these lights. And we turned around and we just sat there for an hour, just amazed as the first time either one of us had seen them and they were dancing all over the skies. And it was it was a pretty surreal experience at that moment. I mean, I remember thinking like, you know, this is, this is why it's worth it right here. This is pretty darn cool. No, that's amazing, man. That's a, a Canadian moose hunt is definitely uh very high on, on my list of hunts I want to do. I think that one's just right behind uh, an Alaskan uh, brown bear hunt, but uh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And that's what I mean. Like it was, it's always, I've, I've watched, I've been on several moose hunts here in the States where we're shooting Shiras and, and they've always really intrigued me. I've always been into, um, photographing them. I've had several close encounters, um, grew up around them. My dad shot a good bull and, and that's a hunt I'll never forget. And so that was always up there, you know, and, and I'd, I'd probably have to say that it was number one for me. Um, and so when it just, when it happened, I mean, it was literally just a phone call at midnight that said, if you can be here, let's go. And I have a extremely patient wife that understood <laughs> that, you know, and, and so I left for 15 days and was in the back country out of, out of touch, out of service and, and just got lucky on an incredible bull. That's awesome, man. Congratulations on that. It's appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm scrolling through the photos right now and they're just, they're great. It looks like an awesome bull. Yeah, it was uh it was a once in a lifetime experience right there. I mean, if I if I never get to do that again, it'll be okay because I got to got to see some pretty cool things, but I'm sure going to give it hell trying to go out back again. That's for sure. <laughs> I was going to say it's kind of it's kind of one of those weird things where you're like, "Okay, I did it, but it was so amazing." Now how do I do it again? <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and it was it was so it was so I guess bittersweet maybe because usually these hunts you prepare for them. I mean, we all have those elk hunts or whatever it is that you prepare for. We get in shape for and and financially you prepare for it and you build up for years and years and then you go and there's this big build up and you kill the animal and it's just this excitement and and the way that this hunt played out is you know, in my mind, I was like, there's, I can't, I, I just can't afford it right now. I know I can later in life, but right now I need to focus on other things. So I wasn't prepared. Uh, I mean, mentally for that, everything else I was ready for. And, and so it wasn't 72 hours from the time I got the phone call to the time I was sitting behind the gun, looking through the scope at this record book moves, like, wow. You know I mean? <laughs> so it was just like, and I just remember like, I was going to build up my whole life for that moment. And all of a sudden here it is happened this fast, you know? So it was, it was pretty, pretty crazy. I mean, and it still hasn't quite set in on me yet. I mean, I, I, we, we all have goals and dreams and I just like, well, I just killed my dream animal, you know? So now I'm working <laughs> towards what's next, what's next and doing stuff like that. But no, it was a good, good year for me. 
That's awesome, man. Um, so uh, talking a little bit about photography, um, you, you know, you said you, you tend to film more hunts at this point than, uh, than you get to go on for yourself. For sure. Um, what would, uh, do you have any tips for, uh, someone that's, uh, maybe looking to start filming or photographing their hunts a little bit, uh, as they're getting into the back country, you know, maybe someone like me that, uh, not super experienced, uh, but knows his way around some technology and wouldn't, uh, wouldn't mind having some, some good photos or good footage to remember his hunts by. No, for sure. And I, I get that question a lot and I always seem to come up with a different answer at the time, but, uh, one of my, my favorite answers for it now is, is to basically learn your equipment. You don't have to have the top of the line. I mean, when I started shooting weddings and stuff, I had bought a $150 camera off Craigslist, you know, and, and I, I remember, I had contacted a, a TV show, a hunt or a hunting channel. I was like, Hey guys, I'm going to film all my hunts this year and I'm going to send it to you and you guys are going to post it. And <laughs> like, I'd, I mean, this was only four years ago and I sent that to them and they were like, Oh, all right. Like, let us know when you're ready, you know? And I was like, well, crap, I only have a GoPro, you know? Like, <laughs> like what? So, so I ordered this camera and like, I acted like I knew what I was doing. Like my, even my wife was like, man, you got this figured out. And I ordered this camera, you know, minimal research. And I had ordered a, a microphone to go on the top of it. And when I got it, the camera didn't even have a record button. I mean, it was strictly oh. pictures. And Jeez. I was like, oh, oh, that's fine. I guess I'll figure something out, you know. So, um, but but to go back to that question, I think is just learning how to use your camera um, and what it does. Um, you don't need the, the latest and greatest, but if you learn the settings and and what they can do in certain situations and, and just how to make a picture look that much better, um, whether it's your shutter speed or after or ISO. And, and so the biggest thing is just make sure that you understand how it works and how you can use it in different settings, whether it's cloudy or sunny or, or things like that. And, and don't, don't kill yourself on thinking that if you spend four or $5,000 on a lens and camera that it's just automatically going to take better pictures because if you don't, understand those basic settings um it's not going to take the picture that you have in your mind you know so mm -hmm. um and, and the, the second thing i tell people is just to take pictures every day um i make it a goal to take one picture every day whether it's i go outside and i'm like hey this flower looks cool or the sunset or whatever taking pictures of my kids or my family i just make sure to take a picture every day because that way i'm always training myself like, oh, the lighting's different here or the settings are different. This kid's moving faster. How do I capture him without being blurry? Things like that. So I just try to take pictures every day. So I always have my camera handy. I always have better. I'll run out, snap a few pictures, download them and, and work on them. So I'm always trying to teach myself. That's awesome. And you know, it's, you, it, it kind of echoes to what I, I think it was, I think it was on the Kafaru cast, uh, Aaron Snyder and, uh, and Frank Peralta's new podcast, they were talking a little bit, you know, Aaron's a big photographer too. Um, I think they were talking a little bit about something, something similar and they're talking, you know, yeah, you don't need to go out and buy the, the biggest, best gear. He was saying, go spend, go spend the money you have on something used. You'll, you yeah. know, don't be afraid as long as it's, you know, not busted. <laughs> um, don't be afraid to buy something used. No, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I've shot, I've shot on used cameras for for years, and and two of my cameras now, I mean, they're they're a higher end camera, but I still have bought them used. Um, that's that's a good point. You, you can you can save almost half buying used, and, and for what we're doing, they work perfect. Yeah, I mean, you can get so much more camera that uh, you know, buying something from a year or two ago that. Uh, someone has since upgraded from um you can get so much more camera doing that than trying to than trying to get something brand new exactly exactly so yeah i mean that's that's a good point um i mean i 90 percent of my cameras have always been used so that's uh that's a good point for sure well so if uh folks wanted now to uh follow your your adventures specifically and check out the photos uh where's the best place to find you online uh, just my Instagram, just, uh, Sawyer, it's at Sawyer Ted. Um, so just my name and my middle name and, 
and I try to keep it regularly posted up. You know how tough that can be sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I try to post a lot of my photography. I do a little bit of uh, editing in my stories so people can see how I edit uh, videos and pictures and stuff like that and seem to have a good response off that. At least people seem to like it a little bit. So, yeah, you can check it out there. Um, that's where that's where 90% of my content goes to. Alrighty, I will make sure once again to post the link up on our show notes page, livingcountryinthecity.com slash 46. Um, now, before we, uh, before we start closing it out, um, you know, I always like to end with maybe some advice or inspiration that you might have for someone from the city or a new hunter that's, that wants to get into hunting, wants to get into the outdoors, but may feel intimidated. Yeah, um... I think the big thing is, is don't set yourself up to be like, uh, all the other Instagram hunters out there, you know I mean? Cause obviously that's what a lot of us, sadly enough, that's what a lot of us base our success off of is we see these pictures that are taken by professional photographers and professional hunters. And we're like, well, that's what I want to go do. I want to go kill that 380 inch bull. And in reality is what we aren't seeing is what those hunters have gone through to do that. Um, I mean, the, the amount of unsuccessful hunts that we've all been through and the amount of times we haven't drawn tags and the amount of times we couldn't make it to the top of that mountain because we weren't in shape or things like that. So, so for somebody that's just starting, like I wouldn't base your experience off what you see others experiences on. Um, that, that's one of the biggest things right now is just not to, not to think that you're going to go out and shoot the biggest bull on the mountain that, or that you're going to go get a limit of ducks the first time or anything like that. Like more, more focus on like, how can I learn and how can I be better at this? Um, I, there was a lot of times, uh, like I said, I mean, we just kind of grew up road hunting, so I didn't know the whole technicalities of stocks and wind and playing wind and, and scent and stuff like that. I was more of a drive around. If it runs out, we shoot it kind of guy. Um, you know, which was just the way I'd grown up and I didn't know much different. So now that I've gotten into these backcountry and where we're playing the wind and we're playing the weather and stuff like that, I, I always just try to learn and not base my success off of other people's pictures that I'm seeing. Um, so just go out there and, and try your best. I mean, find some mentors, message them, learn from them. Um, if they're not willing to give you the time, that's not the kind of people you want to talk to anyway. So just just message people and see what you can learn. Give any advice you can, um, whether it's gear or anything like that. And and another big thing is buy what gear you can afford. Um, if you can only afford a pair of Tascos, then make the best with it, you know. Or if you can or afford a pair of Suaros, then good on you, and it's going to help you. But don't 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 ruin your opportunity for other hunts because you're spending so much on gear. Um, I see a lot of people do that where they're spending thousands of dollars a year on a new bow and new gear and that's uh, i mean two grand will get you three out of state tags so just uh use what's use what you can um i mean we've all hunted out of walmart camel for a long time before we wear what we do now so just uh make sure make sure you're prepared that way and i mean the biggest thing is just have fun i mean there's i've been on more unsuccessful hunts than i have been successful and some of those are are my favorite Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for hopping on today and sharing your time. Uh, you know, once again, hopefully uh, we can get some more eyes on Sheds for Santa. I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's absolutely great what you're doing and I'm, you know, want to help out however I can. So I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me on. All right, y'all, that'll do it for episode 46 of Living Country in the City. Make sure you check out Sheds for Santa. Dig through your closets, find those old shed antlers, maybe find some old gear you can auction off. Do whatever you can to uh, help out Sawyer. Feel free to reach out to him on the page, uh, shedsforsanta.com. We'll post up links to all of that on our show notes page at livingcountryinthecity.com slash 46. Until next time, keep it country, y'all. Thank y'all for listening to Living Country in the City. Get show notes and check out the blog, product reviews, events, and more at livingcountryinthecity.com. I was kind of born right into the middle of it. Hey, really was, quick? Yeah. Um, I completely lost you right after I asked the question. <laughs> Shoot. Can I restart that? Uh, and rewind and we're back. <laughs>
<laughs> um, Perfect. 